Hi there, and welcome to the final screencast of the Mechanical Systems Unit. Uh, this one will be uh, fairly short. It's just uh, a discussion on uh, how do we evaluate a mechanical device? As in, how do we look at the way it works now and improve it or give it a quick critique? Uh, so before we, before we get going, technology and science have been interrelated since the dawn of technology. Just a couple of quick questions for you to think about. How does science, what we do in class, affect technology? Or how does technology affect science? How do they interact with each other uh, on a daily basis? I might suggest that science affects technology in the sense that uh, we go to the moon and the, the, the drive to go to the moon generates new technology that we hadn't thought of. And then technology, uh, what we do in, for let's say, the field of medicine, what, we're, what we can do at the, uh, the very small level, the cell level, affects how we understand our human body. So that might be how technology affects science. Uh, but first of all, uh, mechanical devices, as we have examined this entire unit, have evolved over time because of science and the development of technology alongside. Now, as things have changed over the years and have we decided to use newer, faster, smaller, slicker devices, we have developed a set of criteria that we evaluate how well and, and how efficient a machine operates. Uh, there are many criteria that you can think of if you just rambled a few off, and we're going to list a few here. Uh, what criteria could be that would help evaluate a, a simple machine or a complex machine? And that was scientists and engineers and any other uh, inventors who want to develop devices have to think of two things. They have to think of both function and design whenever they build a device. Now function is what the device is supposed to do and design is the form of the device that makes it usable. So here's a good example. These two bikes both have very similar functions to get you from point A to point B. But when you examine a little closer, the high-tech Indian motorcycle on the left, clearly designed as a function to get you there faster. And we can see in the design of the bike how it's, it's been built to do that. It's very, very aerodynamic, very light. The, the bike on the right, uh, maybe not designed to go super fast, but this would be more of probably a, uh, a little bit of a dirt bike, but more so probably a mountain bike uh, to get up those steep hills and to go across rough terrain. So the function of that bike, although to get you from point A to point B, is similar to the bike on, on the left there, uh, the design of it is incredibly different because the fundamental function is, is, uh, is slightly changed between the bike on the left and the bike on the right. And of course with technology, where it's come from, let's say the late 1980s, early 90s, picture on the left there, a large mobile phone, to let's say the first Nokia here, I remember having a phone very similar to that, to when the first BlackBerry came out, to our, the infamous iPhone. The, the function of these machines have dramatically changed, and so have the designs. So when a device is broken, let's say, or your phone becomes ineffective, or it's not working, you have to make new decisions as to what you're going to use to replace the broken device. And that decisions, or those decisions that you have, are based on a set of criteria. So when, let's say, this happens to your, your iPhone, what criteria or what selection process do you go through before purchasing, let's say, a new phone? Okay, well, here's a list that may, may apply to this phone here, but may also apply in general to many devices. When we look at evaluating a simple machine, and we look at changing uh, what we purchase, uh, criteria might include use. What are we using it for, right? Uh, you may decide to go from a BlackBerry to iPhone because of work or because of school. The purpose is in what have you? What are you going to do uh, with the with a new device? How much it costs? I think is probably one of the biggest uh, factors in evaluating a, a machine. Aesthetics, how it looks. Most people want something that looks good, not only works well but looks good. Um, the last two here, workmanship and reputation, are less in the forefront of people's brains, but are equally important. Uh, workmanship, how well is it made? If you go to buy like a, a bedroom set, you don't want that's 
want you don't want one that's made by like Joe Blow down the street. You want one that's made by somebody that's that's reputable, that somebody has uh, spent time and energy to build it. And that's how reputation comes in too. You go through a company or a maker that you trust and you know that has a, a good quality uh, material or a good quality piece of equipment. So those are just a few criteria that might help you evaluate a device. Now, when we evaluate a device for, let's say, development, okay, uh, it's to determine how it can be improved. The environment that can have an impact on the design of a device as well. So when we say development, what we mean is that, for example, the mountain bike terrain, or the uh, mountain terrain bicycles, they came as a result of how the bike would best fit function in a rough terrain. So they developed the bike based on where they thought it would need to be used. We also evaluate machines considering tech, um, sorry, considering environment. Uh, what if what environmental costs or environmental factors will play a role uh, when this machine is being used, and after it's been discarded, uh, how how will it be discarded, and do those decisions outweigh how useful or effective the machine could be? Some people say yes. Some people say no. Okay. Now, invariably, technology leads to change. Uh, look at the phones again, tablet technology or computer technology, vehicle technology has has changed drastically over the last 50 to 100 years. And new materials in science and technology and in society contribute to the new evolution of and development of devices. Some advances in science resulted in new technology. Take for example electricity. Okay, uh, As more people started to use this new technology uh, society changed. Okay, uh, more people studied and learned about electricity. More people got uh, a better understanding of how it worked, and therefore you have new technologies that that come arise. So, first identified uh, in in the 1700s, an electric charge, Charles Coulomb, and he says there's something here. There's something causing it to to change, and it took a hundred years before somebody finally said, "Hey, we can actually um, start to use electricity." And then until, let's say, the 1940s, uh, it was available to everybody. Before the 1940s, only a select major centers might have it. And as scientists and engineers and engineers learn more about the new energy source, and they found ways to use electricity differently. And they find ways to better our energy sources, so we're not maybe using electricity. We get stuff like uh, better light bulbs. We get energy used for electron microscopes. We get energy used for, for all sorts of different things. All because somebody first in the 1700s or maybe earlier first had this idea of a current or, or something with an electrical charge. Okay, So things have changed. Uh, for example, I'll take another example here. Uh, the maglev train. Because we have such a better understanding of particles and how magnets work, we could use those uh, with this train to generate very high speed trains with no wheels or tracks. That they're instead powered by large magnets and they can propel the train up to 350 kilometers an hour or faster because it works with the particle technology and, and uh, magnets. Now, when you go to my YouTube channel, what you'll also be able to see is my maglev ride. Uh, I took a maglev ride and uh, I videotaped the speed and what that experience was like and you by all means go back to my YouTube channel or my YouTube and check it out. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see how fast it goes and the perspective on that. So how exactly do maglev work? Well without getting into too much of the technology here's a brief schematic. Uh, what you basically have is the idea of a train being pushed forward based on the repulsion of magnets. And so as you have two magnets that are opposite, the, they don't want to be near each other, so you have a, a repulsion. And these, are, these magnets are turned on and turned off through an electrical current. So as they switch on, you have the train being pushed forward, and they switch off to reduce the train from going backwards. We're kind of propelling the train in one direction. Now, you don't have to know how this works, okay? but what you do need to understand is how uh, science, the understanding of magnets and particles and currents, have guided technology, have developed to, uh, developed into huge uh, transportation changes such as the maglev train. And of course, uh, the drive to develop more effective, let's say, uh, even robots came from the need to replace humans in the work or in the workplace. Now, robots have been, you know, in movies and TV shows for 50, 60 years, and and how they look and how they react and and what they do has changed. Uh, 
But as we got smarter and we understood the technology behind uh, uh, manufacturing and the technology behind using robotics, we learned that we could replace us with a robot and become much more effective, much more productive, and uh, reduce costs. And industry has done that. Uh, way back when they started building cars, every piece of it was by hand. You go into an assembly line now, and because of the understanding of technology and the understanding of, of how it works, you see this when you go to an assembly line for a car factory. You see a lot more automated stuff, a lot more uh, robotic arms working with hydraulics and electricity to, to build the vehicles with human influences along the way. I mean, there are some things that machines simply still can't do, and that's where we come in and, and we, we do the jobs that we do to build the cars. So this all comes from an understanding of how technology and science uh, can be uh, influenced by one another, and that's drastically changed society too. And you can also uh, uh, get a, a hint for where we're going with technology through this guy here. His name is Asimo, and he's built by Honda, the same people that uh, uh, build uh, uh, cars, and he is a very fascinating robot. Do a YouTube search or Google search for Asimo and check out a video on him and see how he moves. He's the first uh, robot that actually moves uh, like a human does, very step by step, very uh, uh, accurate uh, movements. And it's incredible on how our understanding of uh, machinery and equipment has led us to uh, building this guy here. Uh, so this screencast here was all about evaluating mechanical devices. You need to know the difference between function and design. And you also need to know function and design, just a reminder here, function and design. And you also need to know just what a small uh, a small sample of criteria. How do we evaluate machines? These are a sample set of criteria. Okay, those are the two big things you need to know from this screencast. Uh, that's it for the unit. Uh, I hope these have been very valuable. And uh, any questions, as always, please ask.